Absolutely. Great. Well, it's 11. Welcome and good morning, everybody. I'm Griff Palmer, VP of Marketing at Positive Recovery. And Positive Recovery is grateful to sponsor and offer this last of three webinars in April. Uh, we appreciate you joining this morning. At Positive Recovery, we embrace those struggling with addiction and relapse using the science of happiness and evidence-based treatment to help you and your clients thrive and create a sober, meaningful life. And for you therapists and clinicians and those in helping professions joining us, uh, we understand the frustration of addiction and relapse. Um, we know that your passion and the help and support you provide in your role, uh, that sometimes finding a treatment resource for your patient, um, you know, to give them the right care and a fighting chance for, for a new life can be a tough decision. So, um, we want to just ensure that you understand our passionate and experienced staff. Some you'll meet today uh, use Dr. Power's groundbreaking positive recovery curriculum and evidence-based therapies proven to help clients overcome alcohol and addiction disorders. So if after this morning you want more, uh, I'll put a few resources in the chat. Um, and one of those, uh, I'll talk about a couple of them here. One is Dr. Power's book, uh, the Positive Recovery Daily Guide, Thrive in Recovery. So uh, this is a book Dr. Powers wrote. It's available on Amazon. I'll put that link in there. Uh, this life-changing book introduces positive interventions, which we call PIs, uh, that are designed to improve relationships, increase meaning and purpose in life, strengthen recovery, and balance emotional health, all while boosting overall happiness and well-being. So everybody knows avoiding a relapse is a success in itself, but really flourishing in recovery is really quite another thing. Uh, that's why these positive interventions are made to build a foundation that's tailored to help you thrive throughout the process. And we're excited to announce that recently we've taken the book and converted it into a daily email. Uh, so if you wanna receive the daily email uh, from his book, Daily Recovery Guide, um, We'll put that link. Uh, you can. We'll also put a link in there that you can uh, subscribe to the podcast that Dr. Powers and Julie Denofa, our president, do. Um, and now I want to introduce you to Colleen Alfers, our amazing executive director at Positive Recovery Hill Country. So, Colleen is a licensed chemical dependency counselor in the state of Texas. She's been working in the field of addiction for ten years. She has an Associates in Human Services from Lone Star College, a Bachelor of Science in Interdisciplinary Studies with a minor in Communications from University of Houston downtown, and is currently working every weekend on her <laughs> Master of Science in Addiction <laughs> Counseling at Texas Tech School of Health Professionals. Colleen has worked in all different treatment modalities from residential to outpatient, including working for a nonprofit. Uh, she's worked in clinical roles and leadership roles. And as I said, is currently the executive director of our newest residential facility, Positive Reco Recovery Hill Country, just outside of Austin in Spicewood, Texas. So Colleen's passion is helping people overcome the guilt and shame associated with addiction so they can work towards creating a life with meaning and purpose. She believes and is really inspired by the positive recovery curriculum uh, created by Dr. Powers that's at the center of everything we do at Positive Recovery. So she uh, believes the greatest reward in working in the field of substance abuse is watching people flourish in recovery and in life. So as we do every week, since it's our tagline, woohoo, woo Colleen, welcome this morning. Good All morning. yours. Thanks, Griff. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Colleen Olfers, and I am the Executive Director at Positive Recovery Hill Country. Um, it's great to be here this morning. Um, as, as Griff mentioned, you know, my favorite thing about what we do at Positive Recovery is the Positive Recovery curriculum. Um, I love the fact that clients come into treatment and we we start with identifying their strengths instead of their deficits and then we use those to build them up um, and build up their recovery. 
I have been working with Dr. Powers since 2012, um, so we're getting old. <laughs> and one of my favorite things uh, about Dr. Powers is that he truly does believe in, in everything that he's created. Um, his, his attitude and outtake and, and just, you know, pushing the staff and the clients to really use their strengths, um, not only just in, in recovery, but also in every, every aspect of their life. Um, I love his strength of humor. He's got mad dad jokes like, like nothing you've ever heard. <laughs> so Dr. Powers is the chief medical officer and creator of the Positive Recovery Treatment Curriculum. Positive Recovery Centers is the only treatment center that utilizes this approach throughout the full continuum of care. Evidence that we are ahead of the curve can be seen in such recent publications, such as Positive Psychiatry, a new scientific textbook written for the psychiatrist by luminaries in the field, which recognizes exactly what we have been applying for a few years now. Dr. Powers is board certified in family medicine and addiction medicine, and received a master's in positive psychology from the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Powers has been recognized as one of Houston's top doctors six times by H Texas Magazine and was awarded the Compassion Award by Sierra Tucson. Dr. Powers is also a member of the editorial board of Addiction Prevention and Treatment Magazine, has had blogs on Huffington Post and Psychology Today, and is a published author of When the Servant Becomes the Master, an A to Z guide to all things related to addiction and the Positive Recovery Daily Guide, a self-help guide designed to intentionally boost the drivers of human happiness, positive emotions, engagement, relationships, meaning, and achievement. If you would like to sign up for his podcast or daily email, just put your email in the chat. And now I present Dr. Jason Powers. Thank you so much, Colleen and Griff and everyone, and thanks for joining us. And so a little disclaimer, um, I threw my back out, so I'm in a lot of pain and I'm super nervous about this. So if I start sweating profusely, you'll know why. Um, uh, so art, um, I'm probably, if you would have told me I was presenting anything on art, uh, you know, from 10 years ago, prior to that, I would have laughed because this is, oh, this is really, this used to be my pervading ideology on art. Like the difference between art and fart is just like a little letter. And, and why? Well, um, I never took art appreciation. I didn't really know anything. I, I did know that there was this uh, sculpture of the fountain made by Marcel du Duchamp or Ducamp in 1917, where he like, you know, re put the urinal like in a different position and submitted it. And this work is regarded by art historians and theorists as avant-garde, as one of like uh, an avant-garde major landmark of the 20th century. So I, I just, you know, I just really didn't, didn't get it, didn't like it, didn't know what I was looking at. And um, in my master's program at Penn for positive psychology, we, um, it was applied. So we, we did a lot of uh, ex, uh, experiential work, of field work and we would have different modalities. Like, we, you know, we would look at the, the good life or the, you know, well-being of people through philosophy, through literature, through music, and through art. And the art one was, was tough. Um, and, and so this, this has been like the, this like, I guess, CEU here, it's the first time doing it. It's kind of a culmination of me starting off by arguing a lot with my professors uh, that, you know, give me a break, you put a urinal in the museum to really seeing it. And um, I'm not alone, like the modern world thinks art's very important. It, it's like almost close to the meaning in life and evidence of this elated regard can be found uh, in new museum grand openings and channeling significant tax dollars towards the production and display of art and the, and the desire on the part of the guardians of art to increase access to works especially for children and minority groups and the prestige of academic theory and the high valuations of commercial art market like you know you know you read about certain certain pieces of art going for just outrageous amounts of money and you know despite all of this our encounters i'm speaking for myself but also a lot of people i know are our, our encounters with art don't always go as well as they might like we're likely to leave highly respected museums and exhibitions feeling underwhelmed or even bewildered and inadequate as I did often wondering 
you know, what the, what, you know, what, why wasn't there a transformational experience? Um, you know, it, it's natural to blame oneself or to assume that the problem has come down to a failure of knowledge or a capacity of feeling. I love this. Like, I may not know much about art, but I don't know what I like either. And I know a lot of people feel that way, but art is therapy. So I'm not really going to talk to you about art appreciation. We're not doing art therapy. We're doing art as therapy or art is therapy, sort of a, uh, through the lens of psychology and how can it apply to our lives in general, but also a little bit and, and kind of like how we use this ethos at positive recovery and how you can use it in your clinical setting. And, you know, artist therapy could be a, a statement that seems rather exaggerated, but it's, it's unfamiliar. And um, it's only because we're not, we're not used to talking about it, but hopefully this can start a little bit. But a lot of people like um, Alan de Baton argue that the problem isn't located in us. It's not in the individual. It, it lies in the way that art is taught, sold, and presented. Like since the beginning of the 20th century, our relationship with art has been weakened by um, profound institutional reluctance to kind of let us all know what art is for, right? When schools get pay cuts, you know, this type of thing gets cut, not science and math. But what art is for is a question that is quite unfairly come to feel impatient, illegitimate, and even disrespected. The saying art for art's sake, we hear a lot, is specifically rejects the idea that art might be for the sake of anything in particular, like we'll argue. So it leaves the high status of art mysterious and you know, kind of what, what do we do with it? So despite, uh, sorry, just despite the esteem that, that art enjoys, it's important, it's too often assumed rather than explained. And its value is taken to be like common sense, but it's highly regrettable because we, we just don't know, but art has a purpose. It can be defined and discussed. Art can be a tool and we need to focus more clearly then on like what kind of tool it is and what good it can do for us. So like other tools, art has the power to extend our capacities beyond those that um, nature has endowed us with. So art compensates for certain inborn weaknesses. In this case, I'm gonna talk about it, uh, the weakness of the mind rather than the body. And we'll talk about those in terms of psychological frailties. So for our purposes, I'm gonna define art to mean like works of design, architecture and craft, and all therapeutic mediums that can help guide, encourage, and console viewers, enabling us to be better versions of ourselves. Um, oh, yeah, there we go. So, um, you know, art's a tool, and it's an extension of the body that allows us allows, sorry, allows like a wish to be carried out, right? That it, it's required because of the drawback in our physical makeup. A knife is a response to our need yet inability to cut. A bottle uh, is a response to our need yet inability to carry water. Art's purpose is discovered by asking what kinds of things we need to do with our minds and emotions, um, but we have trouble with. So what psychological frailties might art help? There's seven identified and therefore are seven functions of art for our purposes today. I mean, there are others of course, but these seem to be the most um, you know, convincing and the most common. They are remembering hope, sorrow, rebalancing, self-understanding, growth, and appreciation. And we'll do our best to get through these. Um, may not be able to get through them all, hopefully I will. Uh, if I don't, that's just an excuse for us to circle back on another CEU. So let's begin with memory, with remembering. We're bad at remembering things. Our minds are troubling. We're liable to lose important information, both factual and sensory kinds. So writing, writing something down, you know, making a record is the obvious first response to the consequence of forgetting, but art is the, sen is the second response. And a foundational story about painting <laughs> picks up on just this motive, right? A young couple here, uh, you know, pictured are much in love and they have to part. And in response, the woman decides to trace the outline of her lover's shadow. And out of the fear of loss, loss she makes um, line drawing on the side of a tomb. This was done by Jean-Baptiste Renault. Um, his painting of this idea is really touching because like, if you look at the soft sky of the evening, it hints at the close of the couple's last day together. The, the young man's rustic pipe, a traditional emblem of a shepherd at the time, is kind of held absent-mindedly in his hand while the dog 
on the left looks up at the woman, a dog reminding us of fidelity and, de and devotion. She makes an image in order that when he's gone, she'll be able to keep him more clearly and powerfully in her mind, the precise shape of his nose, the way his locks curl on the curve of his neck and the rise of his shoulders will be present for, for her while many miles away, he tends his flock in a verdant valley. The insight it offers concerns psychology rather than ancient history. So John Baptiste here, uh, he addresses the big question of why art matters. It helps us accomplish a task that is of central importance in our lives to hold on to things that we love when, you know, long after they're gone. And so consider a current impulse to take photographs of our families, the urge to pick up a camera stems from the anxious awareness that our memory is weak and the fear that we will forget, right? Like how amazing the Taj Mahal, how serene that walk in the country, and most importantly, how precious the look of a child as they sat on the floor making Legos when they were seven and three quarters years old. So what we're worried about forgetting tends to be very specific. It isn't just anything about a person or scene that's at stake. We want to remember the essence, what really matters. And so the people that we call good artists are the ones who appear to have made the right choices um, in what to commemorate and then what to leave out. And in John Baptiste's image of painting, it's not simply the overall form um, of the departing lover that the woman wish, wishes to keep in mind here. It's, uh, she wants something more complex and elusive, like his personality, his essence. So in order to achieve this, the art object needs to attain a certain level of sophistication, right? It can't just be a urinal. There are many things that can be recorded about a scene, a person, a place, but some are more important than others. So we describe a work of art, which could include a family photograph as successful when it manages to capture and highlight those elements that are valuable, but hard to hold on to. We might say that the good artwork pins down the core significance while its bad counterpart lets the essence slip away. Um, so Johannes Vermeer, who's most famous for a uh, girl with a pearl earring, in, in this one, Woman in Blue, um, he knows how to commemorate the appropriate details because the woman here um, would have looked different in different circumstances. Like she would have looked different if she was bored, angry, busy, embarrassed, or laughing. There could have been lots of ways to paint her, but Vermeer selected a particular situation and moment when she's taken up like unselfconsciously and thinking about a distant person or issue. And so by creating an atmosphere of intense stillness, he conveys her capacity for absorption. The way her hands are holding the letter seems idiosyncratic. She lightly clenches her fists when another person might support the letter like with open hands um, perhaps this is a continuation of clumsiness when she was a child. We could see her quiet intensity in the slight pull of her mouth as she reads. Vermeer encourages us to look carefully at this part of her face by setting it against a map that, that's very similar in color to her skin, almost as though her mind is off somewhere in the map itself. The clear light is perhaps a bit like her mind, which may operate with a clear, steady emotional brightness. Vermeer captures the, the core of, of her personality. And it's not just a, a record of a person, it's an image of what she was like in this particular mood. And art's a way of preserving experiences of which there are many transient and beautiful examples that we need help containing. So there's analogy to be made with the task of carrying water and the tools that help us do it. Imagine being out in the park on a blustery April day we look up at the clouds and feel moved by their beauty and grace. They feel delightfully separate from the day-to-day -day bustle of our lives. We give our minds to the clouds and for a time, we're relieved of our preoccupations and placed in a wider context that steals you know, those incessant complaints of our egos. John Constable's cloud studies invite us to concentrate much more than we would do normally on the distinctive textures and shapes of clouds, to look at their variations in color and the way they mass together. Art edits down complexity and helps us to focus, albeit briefly, on the most meaningful aspects. In making his cloud studies, Constable didn't expect us to become deeply concerned with meteorology. You know, the precise nature of cumulonimbus is not the issue. Rather, he wished to intensify the emotional meaning of the soundless drama that unfolds daily above our heads, making it more clearly uh, and readily available to us and encouraging us to afford it the central position it deserves a little more often. And the second frailty 
that art can help us with as a tool is hope. Um, the most perennial popular category of art is the cheerful, pleasant, and pretty kind. Like meadows in the spring, um, shade of trees on a hot summer day, pastoral landscapes, smiling children. Um, however, this can be deeply troubling to people of taste and intelligence, right? The love of prettiness is often deemed a low, even bad response. Um, but because it's so dominant and widespread, it deserves attention. And it may hold important clues about this key function of art as hope. Oh, sorry, this was the uh, people of taste that was troubling too. Um, basically, we enjoy pretty pictures because we like the real thing they represent. The water garden that Monet painted is itself delightful, right? And this kind of art is appealing to people who don't have what it depicts. Like it would be no surprise to find a reproduction of, of a painting evoking watery open air serenity in a noisy urban high rise apartment. And the worries about prettiness are twofold. First, pretty pictures are alleged to feed sentimentality and sentimentality is synonymous with superficial uh, or ignorance. So pretty pictures seem to suggest that like in order to make life nicer, one simply needs to brighten the apartment with a depiction of some flowers. Like if, if we were to ask this picture, what's wrong with the world? It might respond by saying, you don't have enough uh, Japanese water gardens. And that's a response that appears to ignore all the more urgent problems that confront humanity primarily like economic, but also moral, political, sexual. And the very innocent and simplicity of the pictures seems to oppose any earnest attempt to improve life as a whole, um, which are, you know, are kind of debunked. And secondly, there is the related fear that prettiness will numb us and leave us insufficiently critical and alert to the injustices around us. Like for example, a worker in a car factory in Detroit might buy a pretty postcard of this, post, of this uh, nearby historic mansion, like in Detroit near the, um, near the plant that he works. And, and in doing so, like the, the fears, you know, if he appreciates the magnificent um, mansion that, that they'll overlook the injustice of the undeserving wealthy person who owns it, right? The worry is that we may feel pleased and cheerful too easily, that we will take an overly optimistic view of life in the world that will be unjustifiably hopeful. However, these worries are generally misplaced. Far from taking too rosy and sentimental of you, most of the time we suffer from excessive gloom. We're all too aware of the problems and injustices in the world. In fact, the brain pays more attention to negative, to scary things. Um, you know, we're all too aware of problems. We're all too aware of injustices. And we can feel debilitatingly small and weak in the face of them. Cheerfulness is an achievement and, it's, and hope is absolutely something to celebrate. Like optimism, is not just good in and of itself. It's an important ingredient of success. People that employ the optimistic explanatory style are more successful. They, they're they happier, they live longer. There's People stay sober with the optimistic explanatory style versus the pessimism. So, um, you know, these facts fly in the face of the elite view that talent is the primary requirement for the good life, for success. In most cases though, the difference between success and failure is determined by nothing more than our sense of what is possible and the grit that we can summon. So uh, we might be doomed not by a lack of skill, but by an absence of hope. Today's problems are rarely created by people taking too sunny a view of things. It's because the troubles of the world are, are so continually brought to our attention that we need tools that can sort of preserve our hope. So the dancers in this one, in Matisse's painting, they're not in denial of the troubles of the planet, but from the standpoint of our imperfect and uh, conflicted but ordinary relationship with reality, we can look to their attitude for encouragement. They put us in touch with an untroubled carefree part of ourselves that can help us cope with the inevitable rejections and humiliations that life throws at us. So the picture doesn't suggest that all is well, any more than it suggests that women always take delight in each other's existence and bond together and mutually you know, helpful networks, it just doesn't happen. You know, if the world was a kinder place, perhaps we would be less impressed, um, sorry, just looking at the time. Like if the world was a kinder place, we would be less impressed by and in need of pretty works of art. 
Like one of the strangest features of experiencing art is its power occasionally to move us to tears, not when presented with a scary image, but with the work of particular grace and loveliness that can be heartbreaking. Um, what is happening to us at these special times of intense responsiveness to beauty? The most striking feature of the small ivory statuette of the Virgin here, just 16 inches high, is her face. It's a face of welcome, the kind of luck we hope to receive when someone is completely wholeheartedly happy to see us. And it may remind us how rarely we have met with or bestowed such a smile. The banana looks full of life and the emerging delight, which looks as if it might break through at any moment, is filled with kindness. And you know, her beauty can give rise to mixed emotions. On the one hand, we're delighted by an awareness of how life should more often be. On the other, we're pained by an acute sense of how our life is not usually like this. So perhaps we feel an ache of tenderness for all the lost innocence in the world. And the more difficult our lives, the more graceful a depiction of a flower might move us. The tears, if they come, are in response, not how sad the images are, but how pretty. The man who painted this picture, uh, this beautiful chrysanthemums, uh, as his self-portrait suggests, was intensely aware of tragedy. I mean, this self-portrait should put to rest any worry that the artist has presented us with a cheerful image out of misplaced innocence. This guy's Henry Latour, and he knew all too well about tragedy. Um, and it was his acquaintance with it that made him more alive to its opposites. And we found that to be true in the general population that people who experienced the most happiness were the ones who had the most amount of trauma. So a lot of the world isn't just pretty, it seems to go further, presenting us with an idealization of life. So let's move to the next sort of idea then. It's like the Harvard Medical School, this is a picture of. It stands in the Longwood Medical Area of Boston, Massachusetts. So imagine the proceedings that are supposed to go on in this building, all dignity, scholarship, calm authority, exactly the sort of professional face these doctors of Harvard would like to present. The building presents an esteemed profile to the world, demanding respect, even reverence. It embodies idealization. Idealization in art has a bad name because it seems to involve endowing something with virtues more glowing than they actually possess, like disguising any imperfections with polish and subterfuge. In modern times, idealization may be seen as derogatory as like the idealizing artist strips away whatever is awkward and disturbing, leaving only the positive. And as in positive recovery, we add the good without ignoring the bad. We disagree that by adding strengths and filling up positivity, engagement, relationship, meaning, and achievement buckets, that we do an injustice to reality. Quite the contrary. We meet trauma and grief head on while adding well being. So, another example this painting by Antoinette Watteau that presents the countryside. And by the way, I apologize to any art enthusiasts or uh, I'm. I know I'm murdering all these artists' names. I'm doing my best. Um, so this one by Antoine Watau, Watau uh, that presents the countryside as a serene and elegant location for pleasure might be criticized for excluding, say, economic realities upon which this vision depends. Like, where are the servants who must bring the wine and fruit? Where are the peasants that the leisure class relies on for their income? The fear is that in loving the picture, we ignore crucial aspects of existence and even in a sense, condone the exploitation of servants and peasants. More personal issue can be at stake. We may worry that a person who has an idealized concept of some parts of life are then less able to cope with the messiness of actual existence, right? Like someone who imagines that little children are always sweet will approach a family weekend with alarmingly brittle and unhelpful expectations and may turn away in disgust from perfectly normal behavior. Uh, this is my favorite thing, like Disneyland. This is how the ad should read. For people that waiting in long lines on the sun, paying $1,000 for water while listening to their children complain. It's awesome. Okay, so it's hard to be surprising that if being realistic, the, the antidote to idealization is judged a cornerstone of maturity, which in turn accounts for certain accepted artistic reputations. Like it's it's normal to rate George Gross, who painted this, with his relentless exposure of the darkness below civilized institutions more highly 
than Angelica Kaufman um, and her pretty visions of the Arcadian life. Gross seems to give us reality. Kaufman here seems to give us a dream according to that argument, but it's worth examining why idealization was for long periods of history understood to be a central aspiration of art. When painters presented things to us better than they are, they did so generally not because their eyes are closed to imperfections. I mean, when we look at the artist in the character of design, listening to the inspiration of poetry, that's the name of this picture, which is stupid, stupid long. The artist in the character of design, listening to the inspiration of poetry. So when, when we look at this, we don't assume that Angelica Kaufman, the painter, was unaware of the realities of women's lives in the 18th century. She was attempting to give expression to her desire for harmony, a longing that was very intense because she was exposed to her own and others' feelings. Like in 1767, when she was 26, she was tricked into a marriage, a marriage by a sociopath um, adventurer who was posed as like a Scottish nobleman. So we should be able to enjoy an ideal image without regarding it as a false picture of how things um, usually are. A beautiful vision can be all the more precious to us because we are so aware of how rarely life satisfies our desires. Similarly, similarly, looking at, uh, looking at our strengths helps offset the downward drag of negativity bias and hedonic adaptation. It is precisely because bad is stronger than good that we should look for the good and in doing so rewire our brains. So returning to the neoclassical facade of the Harvard College of Physicians in Boston, we should allow ourselves to enjoy it as an image of professional decorum and expertise without fearing that we're colluding with subterfuge being played out on a gullible public. The ideal it stands for is genuinely noble. We can love the ideal while being perfectly aware of the fallibility and imperfect motives of the group of men who, commence, who sorry, commissioned its uh, representation. The apparent, the apparent opposite of idealization um, has a lot to teach us about how ideal images can be important to us. We are very much at ease with the idea exemplified by caricatures that simplification and exaggeration can reveal valuable insights that are lost or watered down in valuable aspects. So what can this approach and apply, like we could, sorry, we could take this approach and apply it to idealized images too. Like, Strategic exaggeration of what's good can perform the critical functions of distilling and concentrating the hope we need to chart a path through the difficulties of life. Like our patients are overwhelmed with the negative consequences of addiction, or you might be overwhelmed with, you know, the, the troubles during this pandemic or other things going on. I mean, is it so awful to help everyone discover each of each person's gold and help them lead with their strengths? I, I'd say no. So one of the unexpectedly important things that art can do for us is to teach us to how to suffer more successfully, believe it or not. Like consider Richard Serra Fernando's Pessoa. It is encouraging a profound engagement with sadness. The outward chatter of society is typically cheerful and upbeat. Um, like if you confess a problem to someone, uh, they tend at once to look for a solution and point us in a brighter direction. But Serra's work does not deny or our troubles, nor does it exaggerate them. It tells us that sorrow is written into the contract of life, right? Just as this, this Iwo Jima memorial is confident that we will admit the importance of, of heroism in the armed forces, um, Sara Fernando's Pessoa, named after the Portuguese poet who knew about sorrow, is confident that we will recognize and respond to the legitimate place of the most somber and solemn emotions, rather than be alone with such moods. The work proclaims them as central and universal features of life. More importantly, Sarah's work presents sorrow in a dignified way. It doesn't go into details. It doesn't analyze any particular cause of suffering. Instead, um, it presents sadness as a grand and ubiquitous emotion. In effect, it says, when you feel sad, you're participating in a venerable experience to which I, this mon monument, am dedicated. Your sense of loss and disappointment of frustrated hopes and grief at your own inadequacy elevate you to serious company. Do not ignore or throw away your grief. And too often we are taught if there's bleeding, apply pressure until it stops. Metaphorically too, I mean, we're pressured by managed care to immediately intervene when a patient experiences sadness or grief or another troubling emotion as they embark on their path to wellness. Like why isn't this patient on medicine? Um, Trouble and emotions are not mistakes and are often part of a profound transformative experience. 
Often people need medicine. I'm just talking about, oh, they said they were sad one day. Why aren't they on Prozac? So, you know, it'd be a mistake to rob somebody of the honor of growth. Sadness doesn't mean there's a Prozac deficiency. Anxiety, likewise, could be instrumental in learning resilience. If one is allowed to sit with it, struggle with it, make mistakes, all the while finally learning ways to coexist rather than hide or numb from it. Now, we could see a great deal of artistic achievement as sublimated sorrow on the part of the artist, and in turn, on us when we experience the art. So the, the term sublimation derives from chemistry. So it, it's the process by which a solid substance is directly transformed to gas instead of first becoming a liquid, like carbon dioxide blocks, um, you know, they immediately go to gas. They don't go to liquid first and then gas. So that, that sublimation, and so evaporation is liquid to gas, solid to gas. So that's, sublimation is quite an achievement, right? And um, like in, in art, sublimation refers to the psychological process of transformation, big transformation, in which sordid and mediocre experiences are converted into something noble and fine. Exactly what may happen when sorrow meets art. Many sad things become worse because we feel alone in suffering them. We experience our troubles as a curse or revealing our wicked, depraved character. Um, you know, I could tell you that when I finally heard other people talking about having the same affliction as me, I felt a million times better because that loneliness, that suffering alone, it had no dignity. I was, um, I thought it was because I was a freak because we need help in finding honor in some of our worst experiences. And art is there to lend them a social expression. Like until far too recently, homosexuality was largely outside the province of art. But in Nan Golden's work, it's redemptively one of the central themes. Golden's art is filled with a generous attentiveness towards the lives of its subjects. Although we might not be conscious of it at first, her photograph of a young lesbian woman examining herself in the mirror is composed with utmost care. The device of reflection is key. In the room itself, the woman is out of focus. We don't see her directly, just the side of her face and the blur of her hand. The accent is on the makeup she's just been using. It's the mirror that we see her as she wants to be seen, striking, stylish, her hands suave and eloquent. The work of art here functions like a kind of voice that says, I see you as you hoped to be seen. I see you as worthy of love. Art can offer a grand and serious vantage point from which to survey the trials and tribulations of the human condition. This is particularly true of artworks that are sublime in the romantic sense, which depicts the stars or the oceans, the great mountain chains, continental rifts. These works make us aware of our insignificance, exciting a pleasing terror in a sense of how petty our personal disasters are in comparison with the ways of eternity, leaving us a little more prepared to bend with the incomprehensible tragedy, sorry, tragedies that every life entails. Um, a buddy of mine, we, we were on a retreat and he taught me this form of meditation where I hadn't tried before, where you imagine that you are just a dust, like a particle of dust because in the size of the, the universe, like we're, we're just that small and extending out that way, it, it, is, it is an act of uh, the same type of perspective. So it, it was, it was, it's a cool type of meditation because really it is about getting out of yourself and realizing like, what am I worried about? Like my problems aren't that big, um, you know, Rather than try to resolve, like when we're feeling humiliated um, by feeling so small, like, you know, we could insist on how important we are. Outwork can help us appreciate our essential nothingness. It's all about perspective. Um, so from this perspective, ordinary irritations and worries are neutralized. And a sense of the sublime in our ordinary lives is usually a fleeting state, one that occurs like more or less at random, right? On the highway, we can catch sight of the sunlight breaking through rain clouds over a distant hill on a plane. We could glance away from the in-flight entertainment and notice the Rocky Mountains or the lights of oil tankers in the Gulf. Art can mitigate randomness and chance because it provides tools 
for generating these helpful experiences on a reliable basis. So we can have continuous access to them whenever we're able to like sort of look up from, from our sadness. And again, it's a tool to help us deal with sorrow or other negative emotions with dignity. So Casper David Frederick uses a striking uh, jagged rock formation here and a spare stretch of coast, the bright horizon, faraway clouds, and a pale sky to induce us into a particular mood. We might imagine walking um, in the pre-dawn after a sleepless night on this bleak peninsula away from human company, alone with the basic forces of nature. The, the smaller islands of rock, each swept endlessly by the gray sea, were once as dramatic and thrusting as the major formation set just beyond them. And the long, slow passage of time will one day wear it down as well. The first portion of the sky is formless and empty, a pure silvery nothingness. But above are clouds that catch the light on their undersides and pass on in their random transient way, indifferent to all our concerns. And the picture doesn't refer directly to our relationships or to the stresses and tribulations of our everyday lives. Um, instead, its function is to give us access to a state of mind in which we're acutely conscious of the largeness of time and space. The work is somber rather than sad, calm, but not sparing. In that condition of mind, that state of soul, to put it more romantically, like we're left, as so often with works of art, better equipped to deal with the intense, intractable and particular grief that lies before us. So let's talk about how art can be used as a tool for rebalancing. Really, few of us are entirely well balanced. Our psychological histories, relationships, and working routines mean that our emotions can lean alarmingly in one direction or another. We may, for example, have a tendency to be too complacent or insecure or too trusting or too suspicious, too serious or too lighthearted. Art can put us in touch with concentrated doses of our missing dispositions, thereby restoring a measure of inner balance or equilibrium to our uneven inner selves. Imagine that we have fallen into a way of life that suffers from too much intensity, stimulation and distraction, like work is frantic, even with Zoom and the inbox is clogged with 2000 messages every hour, right? Or is it, is it just me? Excuse me for a second, a little dry. There is, there's hardly time to reflect on anything once the workday starts. However, in the evening, we're occasionally able to return to a perfectly symmetrical and ordered house. Like looking at the vast windows, we see an oak tree in the gathering darkness. We have a chance to resume contact with a more solitary, thoughtful self that had otherwise eluded us. Like our submerged peaceful sides are given encouragement by regular rhythms of minimalism. The, the value of gentleness can be confirmed by how we adorn our living spaces. Our interest in a modest, tender, hearted kind of happiness is fostered by the unpretentious simplicity of our chosen surroundings. A work of art helps us return um, the missing portions of our characters. These are two paintings a really good friend of mine asked me what I thought of. I didn't know why. So, you know, it was, I think this week or last week, but you know, in the midst of me sort of like kind of generating a lot of this like theory and everything, I was like, wow, uh, no one's ever asked my opinion of art. So I went into like great detail on how she seemed to be asleep. And like the one on the right, the, the heart, maybe she played music and this was consoling. Maybe she was having a bad dream, but realizes everything's gonna be okay. I went on, right? And then I was like, uh, what do you think? And she said, oh, I like them, they're fun. Which is, which is perfect, right? Because that is all you need to appreciate art. Um, not everybody is you know, needing something to rebalance them. Who knows, maybe, maybe she hasn't had enough fun in her life and I didn't, you know, I didn't break it down. I mean, it's really like, who knows? But in other words, you know, these things, these examples that I'm, I'm coming up with are certainly are tools and I think they're applicable, but it's not like every time something has to fit a, a, a tool. So, you know, we just need to keep a little perspective with it. But imagine that we're a bureaucrat in one of the sleepier branches of the Norwegian civil service based in like the Trondheim city near the Arctic Circle. And if you know anything about Norway, um, they have a bureaucratic network, 
like nothing else. It's, it's insane. As a friend of mine who's Norwegian um, says, like, so there are people who just sit around thinking on what to tax, you know, like, like they, they've tried taxing people's thoughts, maybe not, but I mean, just like to be a civil servant in Norway is, is quite something. I mean, imagine the DMV on steroids and multiply it by uh, Google and then you're not even close. But if we are a Norwegian, imagine we're Norwegian um, in like a really small city near the Arctic Circle, kind of alone and it's very bureaucratic. And we last experienced an intense emotion, say many years ago, perhaps in college. Our day-to-day -day activities are run like clockwork. We're always home by 5.15. We do the crossword before bed. And the last thing we would need if we were that person in such circumstances to live in a pristinely ordered home, right? We might be advised to, you know, engage with flamenco music, crazy, right? The paintings of Frida Kahlo and the architecture of, in this case, Mexico's Cathedral Santa Teresa and San Sebastian. Like engage in varieties of art that might help restore life to our slumbering souls if we lived in that situation. And the notion of art has a role, sorry, the, the notion that art has a role in rebalancing us emotionally promises to answer that vexed question of why people differ so much in their aesthetic tastes. Like why are some people drawn to minimalist architecture and others to Baroque? Why are some people excited by bare concrete walls and others by floral patterns? Our tastes, the need of stimulation and emphasis depends on the spectrum of our emotional makeup. Every work of art is imbued with like a particular psychological and moral atmosphere. And a painting may, may be either serene or restless, courageous or careful, modest or confident, masculine or feminine, bourgeois or aristocratic. And our preferences for one kind over another reflects our varied psychological gaps. Like we hunger for artworks that will compensate for our inner you know, fragilities and help us to a viable mean, like, you know, balance. We call a work beautiful when it supplies the virtues we're missing. And we dismiss as ugly one that forces us on moods or motives that we feel either threatened or already overwhelmed by. Art holds out the promise of inner holes. And not only um, do individuals use art to supply what's missing, it groups of people, societies look to art to balance existence. If you think about it, like in the ancient, in ancient Greece, artists and, and their dramatists, they paid very little attention to landscapes and all those, you know, marble busts of people and, you know, heads and all that. It makes sense because the way they lived, they spent their days outside. They lived in small cities and the cities were, were mountains close by and lots of water, it was beautiful. So the Greeks hadn't lost nature in themselves. They had no great desire to create objects external to them in which they cohabitated. Art that pays a great deal of attention to the natural world would be prized only when there was some special need for it. And as nature begins to gradually vanish from our life, um, we see it emerge in more poets as an idea. So as life becomes more complex and artificial, as life is lived more indoors, the longing for a compensating natural simplicity gets stronger. Um, and it's also amazing how healing nature is, right? Even pictures of nature helped people in hospital rooms um, heal faster than those who didn't have it. So if you had a window that outlooked a courtyard or nature, that obviously was healing, but like even a picture of the Rocky Mountains helps as well. Um, we, can, we can expect also like a nation that has gone the farthest towards unnaturalness um, would have to be touched most strongly by the phenomenon. Uh, this nation I'd say is, is France because even like the late queen Marie Antoinette had, had constructed this mock farm near the palace of Versailles so she, can so she could watch peasants milking cows. Like she brought that experience to her because it just, there wasn't any of that in Paris. And we can understand the particular imbalances of a historical period by considering which artworks have achieved popularity within it. Like it's a sign that the contemporary uh, developed world is busy and materials, materially satiated when there's renewed interest in art like this, like the Italian paintings of Thomas Jones that are attentive to noble decay and endurance, or uh, in the quiet stony colonnades once walked by the monks of the Abbey de la Thorone. Like a grasp of the psychological mechanism behind taste will not necessarily change our sense of what we find beautiful, but it can prevent us from reacting to what we don't like with simple criticism. We should know 
at once to ask what people lack in order to see a given object as beautiful. And we can come to appreciate their choices even if we don't like them. So not only does art have a role in balancing our characters, it also helps us to be more moral. And the word moral has become hugely troublesome for us in the modern age. Uh, so I don't tread lightly on it, but you know, we don't respond well to recommendations of how we should behave in order to be good. Like we're terrified of being uh, interfered with. But it's evident though that a lot of the best art produced throughout history has been concerned with characters, had a moralistic mission, an attempt to encourage our better selves through encoded messages of encouragement and criticism. We might think of works of art that direct, that direct morality as both bossy and unnecessary, but this would assume that an encouragement to be virtuous would always be contrary to our own desires. However, in reality, when, when we're calm and not under fire, most of us wanna be good and wouldn't mind the odd reminder to be better. Often we just can't simply find the motivation day to day. In relation to our aspirations to goodness, we suffer from what, they, what Aristotle called acrasia or weakness of will. So we wanna behave well in our relationships, but we slip under pressure. We wanna make more of ourselves, but we lose motivation at a critical moment. In these circumstances, we can derive enormous benefit from works of art that encourage us to be the best versions of ourselves. Something that we would do only if we had a manic fear of outside intervention or delusional uh, belief that we were perfect. And the, the kind of cautionary art that is moral without being moralistic, understands how easy it is to be attracted to the wrong things. It's alive to the fact that there's quite good people uh, that end up making big mistakes and they do so unwittingly. Like here in Martineau's picture, we could pick up that the husband's problems stem from gambling and drinking. There are clues like, and I know this is blurry, but there's uh, in the corner, uh, that's a racehorse. And then by his knee is a little flask of wine. Um, you know, this guy's not a monster. His charming and carefree smile isn't forced. We imagine he wants to make everyone happy. He's just unreliable and easily gets carried away. So, you know, we can suppose that an accumulation of little foibles has led eventually to the sale of his property. That's why there's those accountants kind of busy, the accountant talking to, I guess, his mother. Um, the home that had belonged to his family for generations as the arcade fireplace, the armor, the portraits, test tube has been lost on his watch. The whole power of the artist has gone into making us feel shame and sadness of this in a way that might impact our behavior because many of us harbor a few of this man's tendencies in our own psyches. Oh, sorry, I thought, I thought you already saw the racehorse, but um, Christianity has been a notable practitioner of the moral aspects of art. Fra Angelica worked in a society that took it for granted that people needed to be kept on track by ghoulish illustrations of hell. Like the, the artist therefore strived to make his images of hell as haunting as possible. One was supposed to have nightmares inhabited by flesh eating demons one had seen on the wall and to be horrified at the prospect of being boiled alive, right? The ideal response from the artist's point of view would be an anguished complaint by the viewer that they simply can't get that image out of their head. Um, but we could think of a more modern version, secular one, of hell that, that are far less theatrical and maybe more effective for us now. For the non-believing person, hell is just the abandonment of the path of the better self here on earth. Eve Arnold's photographs of divorcing Russian couples are hell in an everyday godless form and all the more convincing for picking up on how common suffering is. Like the real difficulty with presenting moral ideas in art, like, you know, be kind and compassionate, don't blame others for everything, is not that they seem surprising or peculiar, but Rather, they're, they're like obvious, right? Like their very reasonableness strips them of their power to change our behavior. We hear thousands of times that we should love our neighbor and strive to be good spouses, but these prescriptives like lose their, their meaning when, when they're repeated by rote. And the task for artists, they're forced to find new ways of prying open our eyes to the tire, tiresomely familiar, but critically important ideas about how to lead a balanced and good life. It's not easy to keep making what is hellish vivid. The attempt can easily yield just formulaic horror, which ends up touching no one, until a skillful artist like Arnold stops us in our tracks with an image like this that brings home what is truly at stake when we let ourselves and others down. We might wish to hang this work in the bedroom or the kitchen, just the right place so that it can be seen when one is tempted to say in anger, well, that suits me fine. Let's just effing get divorced, see you in court. Moral messages, messages that encourage our better selves can be found in works of art that seem initially to have a little interest in saying anything to us at all. Like take a Korean moonjar, for example. 
aside from being a useful receptacle, it's a brilliant tribute to the virtue of modesty. It stresses lack of vanity by allowing minor blemishes to remain on its surface by being full of variations of color and having an imperfect glaze and an outline that isn't perfectly oval. Like impurities have found their way into the kiln, resulting in a random array of splotches all over its surface. The jar is modest because it seems not to mind about any of this. Its flaws simply reflect disinterest in the race for status. It has the wisdom not to ask to be thought too special. It's humble, maybe, but it's really just content with being how it is. So for a person who's given to arrogance or anxiety about worldly status um, and who fears about being recognized at social gatherings, the sight of such a jar may be intensely moving as well as encouraging. It would be understandable if a person who is at heart sincere and good, but whose arrogance was only a habit built up to protect a vulnerable part of themselves, their insecurity, can find themselves yearning to make a change in their lives under the guidance of the values included in a piece of ceramic, this moon jar. Art can save us time and save our lives through opportune and visceral reminders of balance and goodness that we should never presume we know enough about already. And so there's five minutes left. I do have, you know, a lot, a few more slides, but there's three functions I can go over at the next CEU. I want to be mindful of the time and, you know, maybe be open for a couple of questions. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. Powers. Great presentation. I did get some interesting questions. Um, so I'll just fire away so we can try to stay tight to the hour. Um, one of them was today was primarily visual. How does music and the other senses play into art as therapy? So, you know, I, I spent a lot of time knowing nothing about art and I've been focused a lot on visual art. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm also not an art therapist. A lot of this stuff is theoretical and um, my, my sort of application on it. So that's, that's kind of what this is. And I, I don't think I could say anything insightful about music as art that someone else doesn't know more about. Let me just put it that way. Okay. It, yeah. And any, uh, have there been any gallery or art experiences that have, have had a really big impact on you? Absolutely, without a doubt. Go see the Barnes Collection in Philadelphia and watch um, the art, the art of a steel. I think it's the documentary that talks about the Barnes Collection and that interesting, interesting story. I can't, I don't have enough time, but Got it. Yes, the greatest art collection on the planet. Got it. I see the amazing DC comic books on your wall. Uh, <laughs> tell us about art in your recovery. Yeah, man. So uh, just recently, probably as a result of grappling with this visual art and coming up with ways on how it can help us and help people struggling, help clinicians and patients alike. Um, I, uh, I just, I've had this collection. I collected them with my brother who's now passed, when we were kids, I mean, we spent hours and hours and hours in comic book stores of obviously there was no internet. And man, I, I, I just love the smell of them, the experience of looking at them. I mean, visually, they're, they're, they're stunning. I, these are little booklets that people hand drew every single picture of, and they took a lot of time. I mean, these weren't just like anime outline characters, nothing against anime, absolutely nothing. It's just the, the details on these pictures, multiple of them on every page, is really amazing. And of course, I love like how the stories reflect the politics and events of the times. You know, I've got some from 1930s on. So it's, it's great. And the ads on the back are the best. If you have a chance, they're just so silly now. But anyway. That's great. Thanks for asking. So, about yeah, sure. I, I know Angie, uh, who does art therapy at, at our Houston residential is on today. Um, so I mean, are you, have you thought about other channels that art experiences in, in treatment specifically uh, can affect patients track, whether it's cinema or music or painting, or, I mean, has it made you think about positive recovery curriculum in any different ways? Well, yes, actually there's, um, you know, mo movie night is something that we, that we could do. And I, I, I do have a bunch of movies and how positive recovery application uh, and the discussion after watching the movies can help you know doing so in a group watching a movie and then listening to others perspectives and processing it 
with somebody who is, you know, helping kind of steer, if you will, the discussion I think is very therapeutic. And the same thing could be said of music. Um, yeah, I mean, going, going to the symphony or going, going sober to, um, uh, you know, like a, a concert is, is incredible. Like Socrates said, nothing moves the art, nothing moves the soul like music. That's great. So last one, and uh, it says, what does it say about us in relation to the art we are attracted to or repulsed by? You know, a lot of things, like a lot of times you're we are repulsed by art that either uncovers something very uncomfortable in us or something, you know, that it is distasteful. So those, those could be the same thing. Like I, I go on later to kind of uncover, like, you know, you might have had a bad experience with uh, somebody who was very wealthy. So seeing art of noble men, noble men with noble women turns you off. And it's only on only on acknowledging that and introspecting that are you able to make some traction and gain. I mean, wisdom comes with accepting those parts of ourselves and, you know, sort of understanding or having empathy towards that group that triggers you. So things that you like can either restore balance, like I said, um, or things that are just pretty, and that's okay too, or fun, <laughs> like my friend said about her paintings. So that's great. Well, we've uh, we're bumping up against the hour, so I just want to say thanks again to you, Dr. Powers and Colleen. Thanks for jumping on, and Julie, and a special thanks to all the attendees that joined us. I'm sure we'll do more of these, so keep an eye out on our social media or join the daily recovery or email list and we'll stay in touch, but everybody have a fantastic weekend. I'm thinking I got to go see some art this weekend now. So just Great, say, so, oh, come over. I'll show you yeah. my walls. Fantastic <laughs> presentation. Thanks, Thank Dr. Powers. All right. Bye. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.